Welcome back to Media 7. Schools perform for us the role of loco parentis. For 30 or so hours a week, they stand in place of a parent. Naturally, we want our kids safe in their care. We want them to learn. And we worry about who they're with. All those feelings went into the mix when something shocking happened at Avondale College. When a Korean student stabbed his teacher at Avondale College, you didn't need to be a soothsayer to predict a media frenzy. And the New Zealand Herald appeared to be out in front of the pack, having already chosen that week to publish figures obtained under the Official Information Act that showed police apprehensions in schools spiralling, up 27% since 1998. The shocking numbers gained instant currency in other media. Campbell Live recited them. Police were called to schools around the country 1,658 times last year. Before moving on to the non-statistical approach of heaping up weapons on the desk. OK, so that's from one school. Is that an exceptionally bad school, Kate? Is it... Uh, uh, no, it isn't. On the other channel, close-up host Paul Henry also ran the numbers. The appalling statistics were released showing just how often police are called out to violent incidents in our schools. So has teaching become a life-threatening profession? Before putting a series of propositions to the head of the Secondary Principals Council. It was inevitable that this was going to happen in the end, wasn't it? When you hear about it, it's very much uh, fingers in the dike, really, isn't it? It's on the cusp of crisis. Well, it wasn't at Avondale College where school violence has actually halved in the past few years. But what about those statistics in the Herald? Well, far less widely covered than the Herald's original story was this correction, buried at the end of the online version of the story a few days later. And remember what John Campbell said? There were 1,064 apprehensions for violent offences at schools last year. Well, no. The statistics covered secondary schools and all tertiary institutions, where roles have grown hugely in the past decade. Together, they now account for 1.2 million New Zealanders. But no one who reported the story did the sums on that increase. And really, that was just the start. Would it be rude to mention that the Herald printed a photo of the wrong Korean teenager on its front page? So where are we really? Is school violence spiralling out of control or not? I should note that since that piece was recorded, we've been able to obtain written records on suspensions at Avondale College. From the 2007 year to 2008, suspensions dropped from 86 to 39, and suspensions for physical assault dropped from 7 to 1. We're joined now by two journalists, Keith Ng, who likes to sort damned lies from statistics, and Gail Woods, Radio New Zealand's education correspondent. Welcome to you both. Keith, let's start, I don't know where to start with this Herald story, but perhaps we should start with the headline, uh, schools call cops 40 times a week. Um, are there any mistakes in that headline? Well, Russell, um, first, there were three actually. First, uh, it wasn't just schools, it was uh, schools and universities and polytechnics and wanangas and industry training uh, institutions. So basically anything that this, um, um, that this education is covered by the statistics that the um, Herald was quoting. And second, it wasn't called, um, well, uh, I'll explain that later, but third, it wasn't 40 times a week. It was uh, down to around 32, which you saw in the amended version that we saw on the screen there before. Um, now, when, when the Herald wrote that story, they actually used figures that said quite clearly recorded offences, and they called them call-outs. And so the police guys sort of went, oh, well, actually, no, that's not what call-outs mean. Uh, call-outs, you know, is, you know, you need a police on the spot right now, whereas recorded offence is more like, hey, uh, you know, what's his face has got in trouble again, uh, just wanted you guys to know. So it could just be that, you know, the school So or the idea else. that the police were going out yeah. to schools, or, or, or even schools and universities, uh, 32 times a week, it's not actually what was in the statistics. No, no. So uh, it's basically just recorded, um, recorded offences. But uh, the, the, really, the really problematic thing is that um, the correction actually made it much worse. So on the Monday, that, that first story that was written, they called them call-outs, right? Off these recorded offences figures. And a call-out is when a policeman goes to a school, right? Yep, yep, but this is not what we're talking about. This is just um, the That wasn't the in the statistics that Sorry, the police the, supplied. The statistics, the recorded offences, is simply the police noting that something has happened. So it could be, yeah, there was a fight, we don't need to attend it because it's been dealt with. 
Um, but after they got that call from the police saying that they got their figures wrong, they went and got it wrong even more. They actually went and said, uh, well, actually, we, sorry, we, we thought these were recorded, uh, we thought these were call-out figures, but instead they're apprehension figures, which they're not, they're recorded offences figures still. And so they, they went and rewrote the story to say that uh, there, were 40, there were 40 apprehensions or 32 apprehensions every single week from education institutions. So in that sense, uh, you know, the way we normally use the word apprehension, uh, you know, we, we, we usually think it's an arrest, right? But in apprehension, in that police statistics usage, actually just meant that the police had dealt with it. So it could be that the police had uh, given someone a warning, it could be that they referred them to youth aid, or it could just be that the police actually just noted down that this incident occurred and then said, that's pretty much all we need to do. So, you know, there's, the, there's this kind of mistaken impression that's created by saying, oh, you know, there's a lot of apprehension, police apprehensions from um, schools, uh, which, again, is still wrong. Um, but then, <laughs> to, to take it one step further, um, the same reporter who wrote the story on Monday, on the Wednesday, used, that sa used those same figures and called them arrests. So, uh, it, it, oh by, right. By, so a, a mere, you know, a, a playground fight became an arrest, yeah, by, yeah. but in three days. So, so these same numbers that um, were supposed to be recorded offences, so police noted something had happened. Um, after that first story turned into police call call outs, so police came. Um, by that second, by that second revision, had turned into apprehensions, and by the Wednesday story, had turned into arrests. So, for each one of these times that the police noted hey, an incident happened, the Herald uh, essentially said that an arrest took place from a school, which just blew the whole thing completely out of proportion. Mm. And how big a deal was the fact that the, that the stories at no point noted the, you know, the huge growth in, in tertiary institution populations? If you're looking well, at the headline number, surely you should be going per capita. Well, when they first wrote the story, they said um, there was a 27% rise in uh, violent offences or in apprehensions, um, which was not apprehensions. Um, they said there was a 20% <laughs> rise, but that there was only a 4% rise in the row, and so that's that's much bigger than the 4% rise. But of course, when they were looking at the 4% increase, they were just looking at primary and secondary. They forgot the fact that there was an extra 150,000 uh, two or three students during that time. So it's, it makes a huge difference that um, it, from 4%, that 4% figure goes up to, I think, around 18%. So once you actually skew it together, um, once you actually put it together, the, the increase in, um, in per student offences is actually much smaller. But um, I'd like to note that so, there, was, there was actually an increase. Right. But wh whatever they were measuring, it hadn't gone up by 27%, whatever it was. Well, the problem, still is, not sure. the problem is that we don't know because um, you have all the primary and secondary school data as well as the tertiary data clumped together. You don't know where that crime is happening. And so for them to actually use it as the basis for stories about school safety is just nonsensical. So mm. all we know is that um, sort of in 2007, there was anywhere between zero to uh, uh, 1,064 or more than 1,064, and that these crimes took place at schools. They might have been uh, committed by students, or, or they might have been committed by non-students. They might have happened inside school hours or outside school hours. They might have been committed at universities. So they might have been committed at schools or somewhere else that's an education institution. So the sum of that is that it doesn't tell us anything about schools. <laughs> Gail. <laughs> well, given all that, when I looked at that story on the Monday morning, when I was just keeping an eye on what was going on in the education round, I couldn't really make sense of that story. I was thinking, what do all these figures mean? This looks, this looks too hard, this isn't right. And I didn't really get too worried about it. But how absolutely felicitous it was for the whole stabbing, the covering of the stabbing. They must that have they really had thought these they were, they'd, they'd yeah. in. I was really interested to see that um, TV3 picked up and said something like, this is not an isolated incident. There have been thousands of call-outs to police implying that stabbings were happening all around the country. And of course, if they did, when you see the sort of media, that, the coverage that turned out to that Avondale incident, imagine it we'd be not actually finding out about things that, you know, there's down in Southland, there's all these stabbings taking part, but we just haven't picked them up. I mean, it's just yeah. crazy. It's just Fancy stupid him, yeah. reporting. Mm. And interesting, too, because I wasn't out on the killing fields the day of the stabbing. I was in my cosy office in Wellington, 
And I was ringing around all my education context saying, oh, what are you reckon about this stabbing? It sounds pretty awful. And people were saying, they were going at pains to stress that this was an isolated incident. And yet the TV report was, this is not an isolated incident. Well, I mean, if you saw uh, Paul, Paul Henry's close-up show that night was, was extraordinary. He had a figure in the dike, there was a mounting crisis. Yeah, and I think all those, all those threatening weapons... threatening occupation. I think those weapons were from the PPTA cache of weapons <laughs> they used in the 2002 dispute in case, pay dispute in case Trevor Mellon... Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Was, was that, was that particularly unhelpful because I was waiting for John Campbell to, to ask whether those guns were replicas or real because real handguns are very rare in New Zealand. I, I don't know of any incident, maybe one incident in the, the 10 years that I've been working as education correspondent where guns, it was a gun at school, you hear BB guns, things like that, but no I was really surprised to see that and I, I don't blame the PPTA altogether because underneath this issue there is I won't say violence in schools, there is some violence in schools, I don't dispute that at all, but there is certainly growing disruptiveness and, and growing um, bad behaviour in mm. students, there's no doubt about that. Are, are, are we measuring these things differently on a social basis? Are, are there playground fights that 10, 20 years ago would have been ignored, wouldn't have been recorded, that are being recorded now? Is that a factor? I, I think it's hard to say, but I think if anyone who went to school in the, probably a boy who went to school, a man who went to school in the, in the 70s, there was a, a, an incredible amount of violence from, you know, in some boys' schools and real bullying and almost school-sponsored bullying whereby prefects and older students could hammer the daylights out of the younger students and that was just fine. So to say that schools have got increasingly violent in that way, I think there, there are two issues there. But there's no doubt about it that over the 10 years that I have been covering education, the, the whole issue, the profile of, of disruptive students, violent students, has definitely, it, it's, it's right up there now. It's a key issue. We, we checked with the Minister's office and, and their response back to us was that uh, in the past five years, uh, violence against other pupils had been relatively steady, hadn't increased. Violence against teachers, which includes shoving, uh, you know, we're not necessarily mm. talking about vicious assault. I think, had I think gone verbal, up, had verbal gone, assaults yeah, and, too. And verbal assaults, mm. which, you know, um, had gone up somewhat, but overall the numbers remain small. So why do we get this, this stampede to declare a crisis every time something like this happens? It's such a knee-jerk reaction, isn't it? I mean, I was just sort of, I didn't even watch the TV news that night because I thought this was going to be just such a, you know, moral decay and all the rest of it. And the thing is, I mean, I wasn't covering education when Plato was around, but he talked about the moral decay of youth. He talked about young people rioting on the streets. Peter the Hermit, <laughs> either the 11th or the 12th century, talked about young people having no manners and them being very difficult to control. Every generation since Peter the Hermit has complained about the, you know, the trouble of keeping youth uh, in, in check. So the, there's, when you get a story like this, you know that the you know be dam busters, and we'll have you know go right through how terrible students are, and that you know being a teacher is a life-threatening occupation. D does it worry you that no one checks this stuff? Because clearly that no, no one checked it. The, it the Dominion me Post nuts. used it as well. <laughs> it, it does. It, it, it's I find it very frustrating. I've been a journalist for 30 years, and you know sort of when in doubt, find out, find out, not when in doubt, leave out, make up or whatever. And that's what it seems to be these days. Mm. I no, sound Keith, very Keith, grumpy. I sound as if I was around yeah. the table. <laughs> Keith, you, you actually did, and went and found some numbers that actually did mean something, well, didn't well, you? Before we talk about numbers, um, just the checking aspect of it. Uh, the interesting thing was that uh, instead of looking up these uh, numbers on the website, on Statistics website, where it's openly available, the Herald actually chose to OIA these numbers directly from the police. Now, I, I don't know why they did that, but in that OIA request, uh, in the response to it, it actually quite clearly states this is just this is not just for schools. This is for primary and secondary and for tertiary education institutions like universities as well. So it's not a, it's not a matter of them not checking it. It's a matter of them getting something and not even reading the, the document that came with it or even the title of the tables. So, you know, it, it says it says recorded offences and the next one says apprehension figures. So these are things and that And they introduced these up, terms the like arrest, which never actually featured in the documents they got from the Ex police. Exactly, exactly. So it's not a number, it's not a matter of people not understanding statistics, it's just a matter of not reading the fine print or even the email that came with the, the attachment.
Mm. And I should actually say that um, it, was, it was a blog uh, dedicated to scrutinising the Herald, a blog called Editing the Herald, that I think was the first one to, to blow the whistle on it. I mean, you clearly had done, had done your research and, and didn't go with those figures. But I, I just can't help feeling that, that the pupil needs to do better. Yeah. There is a really good story around what's happening in schools with disruptive, badly behaved students. That's definitely a story. And I didn't feel that that story was actually telling this. It was just a whole lot of figures, and I suspected that the facts were, you know, would have perhaps got in the way of a good story, which is always such a shame. Because, I mean, happen. this brings in and things like special story. education policy yes, exactly. and, and how long we keep kids at exactly. school now. That, that's the real story, is it? It is. And it's also about early intervention. And people know that that works. Some of the figures that were going to be presented to the summit on behaviour in Wellington next week, it talks about the fact that that five percent of children, children in the in the early years of school, who are really badly behaved, go on to commit by the time they're 21 something like 35 um, percent of violent offences. To compare that with the 50 percent of children who aren't badly behaved, who don't kind of um, f figure in those statistics, they go on to commit something like 3% of crime. You know, it's huge. So people know if you get them when they're young. And also, talking about suspensions, suspensions overall have dropped, except in primary school. So they're going up. Now, that's a worry, because they're going to hit the high schools and they're going to have access to maybe well, weapons. I think, wasn't it the 2006 NZEI had, had most of the assaults being carried out by eight-year-olds? 60% of assaults on teachers were carried out by eight-year-olds. I'm not sure of that figure, actually. Well, that was, that was their <laughs> figure. <laughs> Um, but, um, well, and one of the things yeah. I should say is that the, the average age of referral to um, special education services is 10, and yet... Way too late. Yeah, way too late. Last year, the NZDI felt they had to put out a guide for early childhood teachers and primary teachers about how to deal with difficult students. I went to a workshop on when they were preparing those guidelines, and some of the stories are really horrific, from early childhood teachers who were told, you know, to sort of get out of the place and, you know, in pretty bad language for three and four year olds, and also um, being kicked and hit quite violent, you know, at three and four. So, what's going to happen when they hit the schools and then they get older and they've got access to I think we're going to have to save that for our next show because we are out of time. Thank you to both, you both. This, this has been fascinating, and um, I think we're saying could do better. Um, now, fame is a currency in the modern media, and if you work hard enough, you can earn it, as Simon Pound discovered. like a job that paid you heaps to live in paradise and all you have to do is try out all the awesome activities and then tell people about them, wouldn't you? Of course you would! And some genius at Tourism Queensland worked out that if they ran a viral ad campaign around the world and asked people to apply for that job, then it would get them some free news coverage. It worked! 35,000 odd people applied. They had to submit a one minute video like these. They were narrowed to just 50 people. A New Zealander got on that shortlist. Hello, my name's Clark Gayford. I'm 32 years old from New Zealand. Why pick me? Well, for a start, I got heaps of media experience. Doing MC work, radio shows, even a bit of modelling. But Clark has some stiff competition from the funny. I've been swimming all my life. I swam through my exams, I swam through my job interviews, I swam through all my troubles. The attractive. Hi, I'm Julia from Russia, and I'm the one you have searched the world to find. And the seriously experienced. Love the water and the outdoors, free diving, scuba diving, kayaking, kiting. I got my engineering degree, but I hated working in an office, so I ditched that, made a wheeled kayak and pulled it across an unexplored island in the Arctic, was chased by wolves and so on. You may have noticed these applicants are all pretty slick. I'm a radio DJ. <laughs> the ad campaign engaged good-looking media professionals to do their advertising for them. Genius. Check it out. Hi there, and I'm telling you right now that I'm your man. The amount of free coverage that the campaign has generated in the media so far has been estimated at 70 million from a 1.7 million dollar campaign. Right now, there's an online vote going on, so Clark Gayford is running a media campaign to get them votes. He's been on Breakfast, Radio Live, Classic Hits, The Rock, George FM, Sunday News, Herald Online, Herald Spy, Stuff.co.nz, More FM, Spare Room, The Breeze, The Edge, Biggie, Campbell Live, and now Media 7. So, to what lengths would he go to get coverage?
Yep, that's Clark. He'll even swim with sharks. Me, not so much. How did he generate all those stories? I knew a few people. I made a couple of calls. And perhaps that's the strategy. The winning applicant needs to be able to work the media. It's all about being subtle, not taking it too far. You know, knowing when to push it and uh, when to hold back. Clark is pretty onto these media setups. If you give the media great pictures, like swimming with sharks, thanks Kelly Taltons, then you'll get the stories. And Tourism Queensland gets a little more free publicity. Well, that is our show this week. Thank you to Keith Ng and Gail Woods, and thank you to our previous panellists, Davy Hughes, Helen Kelly and Neville Gibson. And thank you for watching. We'll be back with Media 7 at the same time next week. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye.